Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Schlumberger Earnings Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, there will be an opportunity for your questions. If you would like to ask a question, please press 1, then 0 on your touchtone phone. Please be aware that you will, he will not hear a tone acknowledging your request. You may remove yourself from queue at any time by pressing 1, 0 again. You will hear a tone when you remove yourself from queue. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Simon Ferrant, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Slumberger Limited fourth quarter and full year 2019 earnings call. Today's call is being hosted from Houston following the Slumberger Limited board meeting held here this week. Joining us on the call are Olivier LaBouche, Chief Executive Officer, Simon Ayer, Chief Financial Officer, and Stephen Bigay, VP Finance. For today's agenda, Olivier will start the call with his perspectives on the quarter and our updated view of the industry macro, after which Simon Ayer will give us more details on our financial results. Then we'll open up for your questions. As always, before we begin, I'd like to remind the participants that some of the statements we'll be making today are forward-looking. These matters involve risks and uncertainties that could cause our results to differ materially from those projected in these statements. I therefore refer you to our latest 10K filing and other SEC filings. Our comments today may also include non-GAAP financial measures, additional details and reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures can be found in our fourth quarter press release, which is on our website. Now I'll hand the call over to Olivier. Thank you, Simon, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to comment on four topics this morning. First, our fourth quarter performance and our expectations for the first quarter. Second, our view of the industry macro conditions. Third, the 2020 outlook and our goals for the year. And last, an update on our strategy for North America. Before that, however, I would like to say how proud I am of the Schlumberger team's performance throughout 2019. The progress we made in operational execution in a challenging year has been outstanding. During the last six months, we set new benchmarks for safety and much improved our service quality performance. Execution matters greatly to our customers and is the foundation of our performance vision. I feel privileged to lead such a high-performing team. Last quarter performance highlighted the value of our international franchise, where activity was very encouraging. For the first time since 2014, international margins improved sequentially from the third to the fourth quarter. This led to 100 BPS margins expansion from H1 to H2 2019. Several factors drove our international financial performance. Year-end product sales reached one of the highest levels since 2014. We made early progress in reversing underperforming business units across several job markets. Finally, we saw a favorable technology mix on offshore exploration and digital, benefiting reservoir characterization at large and wireline and SIS in particular, both of which had one of their best quarter since 2014. In North America, our team managed proactively the sharp decline in land activity and pricing headwinds during the quarter, while concurrently launching and starting to execute our North America land strategy. I will elaborate on this in a moment. Fourth quarter free cash flow was also very strong, building on resilient cash flow from operations and further progress in the company's working capital efficiency. This, combined with the proceeds from two business transactions, enabled us to reduce net debt by $1.3 billion during the quarter. Overall, the fourth quarter was very solid internationally, with expanded margins, and resilient in North America despite the severe drop in activity and weaker pricing. Taken together, this resulted into year-over-year -year growth in both EPS and cash flow generation. As we transition to the first quarter, most business lines and geography will experience the usual seasonal decline. However, following strong year-end sales and the limited impact of winter disruptions during the fourth quarter, 
we anticipate the international and carbon business to record high single-digit sequential decline in revenue, a seasonal impact marginally higher than in recent years. Also, we anticipate a low single-digit sequential decline in North America, primarily related to the execution of our mile strategy and the seasonal offshore impact. In addition, the recent and persistent market disruption linked to geopolitical risk or civil unrest continue to affect our international international operations and represent a financial exposure during the first quarter. In particular, our activity in Iraq has been visibly reduced due to security risk similar to our reduced activity in Libya. Also, Argentina activity remains muted due to the difficult investment climate. Looking now at the macro, the recent easing of the US-China trade conflict has reduced uncertainty on the economic outlook. And the latest IEA forecast for oil demand indicates growth of 1.2 million BPD in 2020, slightly higher than in 2019. US production growth, however, should slow significantly in 2020 and come well short of last year growth due to heightened capital discipline and resulting drop in activity. Over time, this will create a pull on the OPEC plus and international non-OPEC production base. This macro condition will continue to support the international growth cycle. This, they will also increasingly stimulate the investment to renew activity in offshore and deep water exploration development as the year progress. Moving now to the outlook for 2020. We anticipate international EMP capex spending to grow in the mid single digit range. In contrast, we expect a second year of market contraction in the North American lands with a decline in the high single digit to double digit range. This aligns with the strength of our international franchise and makes the execution of our NAL strategy even more critical to protecting our returns from any further activity downside. With this market outlook, our ambition would be to grow internationally above mid-single digit, excluding the impact of recent divestiture, revert common group to growth on the back of long cycle booking execution, and contain North America to high single digit decline as a consequence of both market conditions and strategy execution. Within this market, the impact of our capital stewardship strategy, particularly the reduction of underperforming business units, will be material. At the same time, the impact of our transformation program should continue to enhance incremental margin performance and cash flow for most of the service product lines. We are confident that the shape and mix of international activity growth will support favorable revenue quality during the next four quarters with contribution from new technology adoptions, stronger offshore activity, and digital transformation. Offshore activity will increasingly grow towards deep water basins in later part of 2020, reflecting the acceleration in investment by IOC and large independent. Therefore, we expect international margins to further expand in 2020, building on a momentum from second half of 2019. In addition, and, and as an outcome of the NAL strategy execution, we also expect North America margin to expand, despite the headwinds on activity and revenue contraction. This will be the first year since 2013 with such an improvement in financial performance across international and North America markets. This aligns closely with our strategy focus on returns, both in margin and cash generation. I now have some comments on the NAL strategy, content and execution to support our margin expansion in North America, despite the expected double-digit market contraction in 2020. In September, part of our new performance strategy introduction included a specific scale-to-fit and technology access approach to restore North America to double-digit margins by prioritizing returns over growth. For the most part, we have completed a review of our current business portfolio performance. We have mapped the outlook scenario and the anticipated market trends and documented all available options, both organic 
and inorganic to achieve a step change in returns and an asset light portfolio transformation. Although this is still ongoing, we are ready to share key aspects of this strategy today. First, and to address one theme, the largest element of our North America portfolio. We have decided to repurpose the business across three hubs to decentralize the support structure around the largest basins. This will further align our organization and capability with our key customers and maximize the positive impact of technology and integration. This has resulted into a net reduction of 30% of deployed frac fleet capacity and impacted visibly our fourth quarter sequential decline. This will represent the new self-imposed capacity cap compared to the levels of the third quarter of 2019, or a 50% reduction when compared with our total available capacity. The greater alignment with key customer and major basins will also increase the number of dedicated frac fleet to more than 80% of the total, leading to a much reduced spot market exposure. While we believe this action improves one team performance, reshaping it for the better into a focused and profitable business line, we will keep our options open and be ready to participate into an enhanced market consolidation offering given the right partner and economics. Second, we will seize onshore coal tubing operations in North America, a market that we believe is commoditized and offers neither the significant integration nor performance technology upside. Third, we are pursuing opportunity for the future of our road lift business line in North America. We believe that this portfolio is best served through regional players that can further leverage the distribution network and better align with the equipment market. We we'll continue to develop the business, support our people, and serve our customers until we find the right opportunity. Finally, we we'll continue to accelerate our fit for basin strategy where we selectively franchise our technology access through a network of local basin-specific partners. This was demonstrated with success by drilling and measurement in 2019. We will expand this asset model, asset light model to other business lines to increase our market reach while optimizing our infrastructure and capex requirements. In support of this decision, we will continue to rationalize our facility footprint with an estimated 25% reduction in operating location before the end of 2020 and adjust the support structure accordingly. We have already reduced our workforce by more than 1,400 employees since Q3 2019. The action related to the strategy execution, when completed, will generate savings in excess of $300 million on an annualized basis when compared to the Q3 2019 run rate. Our ambition for North America land in 2020 has been clearly set for margin expansion despite the unfavorable activity outlook. While our strategic decision will result in revenue reduction greater than the decline of the market, they will contribute incremental earnings and cash flow compared to 2019. This will allow further prioritization of resource and capex allocation towards the international market. I hope that my comment this morning offered you more color on our fourth quarter performance, as well as fresh guidance for our first quarter and full year ambition, while also providing you with insight on our strategy for North America land. Now, before I hand over to Sam Ayat, I would like to recognize the contribution he has made over more than 37 years of his career with Lumerge, and more than 13 years leading the finance function of this company. Salmon steps down next week, but we continue as a senior strategic advisor to me. I'm also very pleased to welcome Stéphane Biguet to the CFO role. I fully trust his experience and functional expertise. With this, I turn it over to Sam. Thank you, Olivier. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in this conference call. Fourth quarter earnings per share, excluding charges and credits, was 39 cents. This represents a decrease of 4 cents sequentially, but an increase of 3 cents when compared to the same quarter of last year. 
During the quarter, we recorded $209 million of net pre-tax charges. This reflected $456 million of restructuring charges offset by $247 million gain on the formation of the Sensia joint venture. The restructuring charges largely relate to our North America operation. They consist primarily of write-offs relating to facility closures and exiting certain activities as well as severance. These restructuring charges and related write-offs were all recorded at the end of the quarter. Therefore, the fourth quarter results do not include any significant benefit as a result of this charge. Our fourth quarter revenue of $8.2 billion decreased 4% sequentially as a 2% growth in our international operations was more than offset by a 14% decline in North America. Pre-tax segment operating margins decreased by 60 basis points to 12.2%. Highlights by product group were as follows. Fourth quarter reservoir characterization revenue of $1.6 billion was essentially planned sequentially, while margin increased 59 basis points to 22.4%. The margin increases was primarily driven by higher SIS software sales. Drilling revenue of $2.4 billion was also essentially flat, as lower revenue in Russia and North America land was offset by increased drilling activity in the Middle East. Margins were flat at 12.4%. Production revenue of $2.9 billion decreased 9% sequentially, driven by a 33% in one stem revenue in North America land due to lower demand and pricing pressure. This decrease was partially offset by strong international completions activity. Margins of 8.8% only decreased slightly by 32 basis points, primarily due to the effects of the lower one-stem activity, partially offset by improved international margins from higher activity. Cameron revenue of $1.4 billion increased 2% sequentially as one subsea surface systems and relic systems each grew. These increases were partially offset by the effects of the divestiture of the measurements business in connection with the Sensia transaction. Margins decreased 359 basis points to 9.1%, primarily as a result of lower margin on one subsea projects and impact of North America on the short cycle activity. The book to bill ratio for the Cameron long cycle business was 1.5 in Q4. The one subsea backlog increased to $2.2 billion at the end of the fourth quarter. Now turning to Schlumberger as a whole, the effective tax rate, excluding charges and credits, was 16% in the fourth quarter, which was consistent with the previous quarter. I was very pleased with our cash flow in the fourth quarter, as we generated $2.3 billion of cash from operation. This brings the total year of 2019 to $5.4 billion from operations and $2.7 billion of a free cash flow. In addition, during the quarter, we received approximately $590 million of net proceed as a result of the closings of the Sensia joint venture and the drilling tool divestiture. Our net improved by $1.3 billion during the quarter to $13.1 billion. We ended the quarter with total cash and investments of $2.2 billion. Over the course of the fourth quarter, we repurchased an additional $1.1 billion of outstanding notes, the vast majority of which were due to mature over the next two years. These repurchases combined with the actions we took last quarter will serve to reduce our interest expense going forward while at the same time improving our debt maturity towers. During the quarter, we spent $494 million on CapEx and $255 million 
of capitalized costs relating to asset performance solution projects, formerly known as SPM. We also made $692 million of dividend payments. We did not buy back any stock during the quarter. Full year 2020 CapEx, excluding APS and multi-client investment, is expected to be flat with 2019. Before I turn over the call to the operator for a QA, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you, our shareholders and analysts. I know we've been through tough times due to industry condition, and overall it has been a very productive relationship. I ask you to please welcome Stefan as the new CFO and extend him the same courtesy. As a departing statement, please remember, cash is king. And now, back to operator. Thank you. And our first question comes from the line of James West with Evercore ISI. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning, Olivia. Good morning, James. Maybe first, uh, for, for Simon Ayat, uh, thanks for your, your many years of, of help, guidance, and, and certainly wisdom, and you will be missed. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. So, Olivier, as we think about um, the second half of, of 2020, you, you talked about revenue quality uh, improving clearly with international and, and offshore. That's a much better mix of business for Schlumberger, for the industry in, in, in general. Could you maybe expand a bit on on that and what it could mean for uh, you know both uh, your, your revenue growth, but also uh, you know mar- continued margin improvement uh, in your business. No, thank you, James. So I think back to what I shared during my prepared remark. We foresee that the uh, year-on-year growth internationally will be in line and slightly better than uh, the current mid-single digits when we exclude the effect and impact of the diversity we had that has an impact on about 2% internationally. Um, I also reiterate the fact that I uh, foresee that the second half will be more uh, robust than the first half on the back of uh, offshore, uh, both uh, uh, the offshore deep water particularly, where we see in the projection engagement we have with our customer significant upside uh, in the later part of the year due to exploration as well as development. So the impact of this we expect will result into not only 5% over the, over the growth for the year, but also uh, margin expansion uh, in excess of 100 BPS for the full year internationally. Okay, that's very helpful. And then I guess if we think about the, the full year, and I know you, you guys don't, don't give full year uh, guidance, but um, it, uh, it seems to me that we've got a bit of a, of a hockey stick uh, going into the, to the back half. And so... Um, you know, as we think about um, you know where the I guess I, I guess uh, where expectations are, both your your internal expectations, our expectations, et cetera. Um, do we think that um, you could that, that the second half strength makes up for what will be a little bit of a weaker than potentially uh, expected first quarter? Yeah, the first quarter indeed, and uh, you have heard my prepared remark highlighting the. High, high single-digit sequential decline uh, for international and Cameroon, the low single-digit decline in, in North America. All of this will combine due to the seasonal effect, the transition from uh, uh, good revenue mix in, in Q4 into Q1 into high decrementals in, uh, into, uh, into Q1. That, that is our expectation. However, I think from the... We will not wait the second half. I think from the second quarter, we expect the, uh, the mix to, to improve, the uh, execution of our mal strategy to start to bear fruits, and the uh, international outlook to, uh, to uh, go back to uh, normal seasonality. So the combination of which should uh, provide the support for growth uh, of our earnings uh, from uh, sequentially from Q2 onwards. Okay, very helpful. Thanks, Olivier. And next we go to Sean Meekum with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Sean. I'd like to maybe just continue a bit more on the framework for 2020. 
maybe just expand on some of those thoughts. <clears throat> so we're looking for margin expansion across both North America and international. Um, could we unpack a little bit of, uh, of what's building your confidence that we're making the turn here on margins? Given the emphasis on the back half of 2020, how much would you say is confidence in what's happening in the market from more of a macro perspective versus the impact of your self-help initiatives? I think to give you more light on this, uh, Sean, I think I would like to contrast North America and international. I believe the international market is poised for further growth. Uh, and I think we come out of a mid-single digit, is poised for further offshore, a mix, including later part of the year deep water, both of which combine to present uh, the good uh, favorable mix that will help us execute. So internationally, I believe that the combination of our self-help through capital stewardship program and underperforming business unit, continuation of our transformation program that had had a positive impact onto uh, the service business line incrementals and the effect of our technology adoption on those favorable offshore markets as well as international digital transformation will all combine to this uh, 100 BPS plus expansion in international. So we have some confidence there. Obviously, all depends on the top line uh, and activity growth, but we have, uh, we have confidence in this, uh, in this shape and into the favorable revenue mix. By contrast, North America will depend on our execution of our NAL strategy. There is a downside risk, as uh, similar to last year. There is some uncertainty on to the uh, market spend and on to the pricing headwinds that could affect and delay some of the uh, benefits that uh, we'll collect from the NAL strategy. But all in all, both for different reasons, more self-help and NAL, and NAL execution strategy in North America and market condition as well as continuation of our progress internationally will combine uh, to shape up our margins next year. Understood. Thank you for that. That's very helpful. Uh, maybe just to continue on North America, a couple of clarifications and just maybe to, to go a little bit deeper. It sounds like you said half of your horsepower is, is going away. Is that being stacked um, with the potential to come back, or, or are we scrapping that horsepower? Maybe just we could, if we could clarify the difference there. And maybe just I was hoping to talk about the rest of the product and service lines. Uh, are there potential for other divestitures or other transformative type of transactions that you're considering? Maybe just to hear about the rest of the – portfolio in North America as well. Yeah, I think you, you have heard the comment we made, and I made uh, in my prepared remarks. We have decided to cut uh, our deployed capacity by 30% when contrasted with the third quarter of 2019, and we will uh, self-impose this as a cap going forward. That results into about 50% of our capacity that we don't intend to deploy. And I think uh, whether it's called, called stack or it's the unemployed, it will not be deployed going forward uh, as we are repurposing uh, our and restructuring our business around three basins or on three large hubs to serve the, the most active basins. And as such, we will not uh, expect to, uh, to increase our capacity. Beyond this, you have heard the choice we made to exit uh, coal tubing onshore, to uh, evaluate divestiture of road lift and to further accelerate our technology access fit for basin strategy to replicate the success of DNM. All of these combined will result into a top line uh, decrease uh, faster than the market due to the self-imposed uh, cap on capacity and as well as the exit of some business units, but also will result into high grading uh, our portfolio margins as well as benefiting from the success on technology access uh, business model, asset light model to replicate DNM and expand. And that is, uh, is uh, what we expect to see. Thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. Next we go to Scott Gruber. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Scott. Uh, just staying on uh, the outlook for North America, you, you know, you provided the, the market outlook and 
commented that um, you know there'll also be a, an impact uh, from scaling down and, and exiting some some businesses. Um, any potential additional color that you can provide on a, a range of um, you know additional impact uh, from the strategic shift you know on the top line in North America in 2020 relative to the market. Uh, globally speaking, I think uh, we gave the guidance that North America lands will see um, will see a market contraction of high single digit to low double digit. On the back of what we are executing, we believe if everything is executed, that will be in the mid teens to high teens in the mid teens decline from the same scope, North America land, in the same scope. Okay, so that that that's the guidance I can share with you. Okay, this extra contraction uh, that we anticipate will be a few, uh, a few percentage point of further decline compared to what we see the market. Got it. Um, and obviously you're, you're exiting, you know, the more capital intensive uh, business lines that, that oftentimes tend to be uh, more um, uh, CapEx intensive. Like you just talk about the, the cash dynamics, you know, in the business, um, you know, as you go forward in, in 2020. Um, are you near neutral on you know, the net cash you think you're going to be able to generate um, in the business in, in light of the restructuring, uh, just given the, the cash consumption from some of these product lines? Uh, is, there, is there a hit? Can you just you know, provide some color on that front as well? Sorry, Scott, is this your question about North America or in total? Yeah, uh, well, in, in North America, you know, how – you know, is is one spin, for instance, you know, cash generative uh, today, uh, such that you lose cash with the scale down, or is it consuming cash today, such that you'd actually save on on uh, cash uh, given the scale down? No, we more we are okay. Simon here again. We are expecting to be better than neutral on one stem, and actually, it's not true that one stem consumed cash. One stem is we've been. Managing it to be neutral, but will be better than neutral going forward. Gotcha. So the restructuring helps the cash profile of one step. Absolutely. 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 Yes. Got it. Important clarification. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we go to Angie Sedita with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Thanks, uh, Simon. I echo James's comments, and I wish you the very best in the next chapter of your career. Um, and Olivia, I appreciate the details very much on your call. This is great to have the granularity that you provided today. So this is very helpful. So I would add on the internet or the North America commentary. If you think through 2020, you commented a little bit on international margins, thought around North American margins under the scale to fit strategy and how we should think about margins over the course of 2020. As you see, lower revenue growth, but obviously margin impact and how we can think about EBITDA in that context. Yeah, I think Angie. So good. Good morning, Angie. So yeah, to to, to reiterate uh, what I shared before, I think the uh, margin progression in, in North America will result from two uh, critical actions. One is uh, the high grading of our portfolio uh, through either capacity restriction, exiting some underperforming business unit or base in location, as well as exiting or or divesting some part of a business as well that were not accretive to our margin or to our cash flow. And secondly, uh, combined with uh, accelerating uh, what we call a fit for basin, what we call a technology access, uh, that is an asset light model aiming at uh, franchising some of our technology uh, to uh, local players, regional players, basin players, uh, and complementing our service, uh, uh, service access, service business model, with uh, an extended market reach with uh, technology sets. So this has proven to be uh, effective, uh, satisfying our customers and uh, expanding our, our market last year with um, accretive impact onto uh, the margins uh, of our segments. So we will continue to accelerate this. So the combination of these two are what we expect to see impacting margins in North America. Okay, so uh, and then further around um, North America and one stem, you know, do you view one stem as core to your operations? Do you think that you need to be in one stem longer term? And what other options for either right sizing the business or strategic partners do you see for that business overall in North America for 2020 and beyond? 
as, as we have said before, we believe uh, it's critical that we fully participate uh, into the North America market first. It's a market that's here to stay. It's a market that uh, will, over time, uh, come back to use and, and align with our reservoir technology and our capability. However, we believe that uh, we will continue to evaluate alternate ways to participate into this market. For now, we have decided that we right size, we uh, scale to fit, and we refocus our one steam operation to be uh, fit, lean, and more profitable. But we'll continue to observe the market opportunity. As we have said, all options are on the table. And uh, when and if an opportunity arises with the right partner and the right economics, we will uh, take the step and, and uh, look at alternate ways to keep participating to the market and yet, uh, yet uh, uh, exit uh, this. Great. Thanks. I'll turn it over. Thank, thank you, Angie, for your comment. Simon, yes. And next we'll, go to, next we'll go to David Anderson with Barclays. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thanks, and good morning. Um, so, Olivier, you, know, you talk about your strategy of an asset light, uh, more technology-driven businesses in North America. Um, it seems to fit pretty well with digital um, being a primary growth driver, as you talked about. You made a number of agreements around Delphi late last year. I was just wondering if you could just talk about how you see the progression of revenue over the next several years. I guess that would mostly be in the resin or characterization business. Is it fair to assume that maybe the top line comes down a little bit initially as you move more towards the subscription-based models? You've talked about maybe this business doubling, um, but I'm just kind of wondering if you could just kind of give us maybe a, a little bit of a, a roadmap of kind of what this looks like over the next few years. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I'm not sure I would give you a detailed roadmap today uh, now, but uh, I, I will comment on, on some of the remarks. So, indeed, we have stated, and I believe we are still uh, setting and having a clear ambition to double the digital revenue in the next few years. Uh, we don't, do not anticipate that the transition to software as a service will materially or will uh, actually uh, negatively impact our, our revenue trajectory. Uh, we have had a pause uh, somehow in our digital in the last couple of years, uh, revenue growth, uh, more due to uh, the market condition, as well as the, uh, uh, the fact that our Delphi offering uh, was not having the readiness and the breadth uh, to uh, expand into the marketplace. So this has been addressed. I think the, uh, the SIS forum that did happen in, in September gave us the opportunity to not only uh, commercialize four new uh, Delphi products, but also uh, create a, a, a step change and, and a new momentum in industry with, a, with our open uh, strategy. So combination of this Delphi new product and the open strategy has created a momentum that has attracted the uh, uh, engagement with customers, and we have seen one of the engagement that has materialized with Exxon uh, for drilling, uh, drilling digital products in North America. So you will see a uh, digital uh, uh, opportunity to, uh, to be uh, communicated in the coming weeks and months, uh, both internationally and in North America, and uh, both uh, in workflow or product, uh, deployment or in uh, edge operation. So we, we are working hard on several fronts with several customers and we're making uh, progress. And I think the leadership we have established is recognized across the industry, is valued, and will uh, only accelerate going forward. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to switch gears. If I could just kind of talk with the Middle East uh, for a moment here. Uh, you had a very good quarter, um, by all accounts, in, in your commentary on the progress in the Middle East. But if kind of comes with a bit of caution on your first half uh, on the remarks about the OPEC agreement. I was just kind of curious on, on two fronts here. Um, isn't much of your business natural gas driven, so, or maybe your mix is a little bit different, but I would have thought the natural gas side would have held up. And then secondarily, if you could just comment on the status of the LSTK contracts. I know that's been a big focus of yours to try to get those fixed. If you could maybe just give us a little, um, a little insight into the progress there. Thank you. First, to answer your, your question on, on uh, the Middle East market and, and gas, the Middle East market, I think, is still very steady and I think is uh, poised for future growth. However, based on, the, on some of the uh, cap uh, of OPEC plus uh, requirements on occasion, we see some of the uh, developments that, uh, that have been started to be either paused or delayed uh, in the context of, uh, of caps. 
Now, the gas is indeed uh, a very active gas development project, a very active part of offshore in, uh, in the Middle East, and this is, uh, this is not uh, slowing down, this is actually accelerating, and we fully participate into this. Uh, coming into the LSTK, indeed, the LSTK has been under scrutiny, be it in the Middle East or across the, across the world, and I'm happy to report that we have made a steady progress uh, to stabilize uh, and improve uh, the operational performance, and also to address on occasion, specifically with some customers, be it in the list or elsewhere, uh, the specific uh, contractual terms and liability that we believe were not appropriate for, uh, when uh, contrasted with risk or uh, the engagement we had. So we have made progress on those. So I'm pleased to report that uh, every time I go to uh, Saudi in particular, I'm getting uh, increasingly positive feedback uh, from the customer, and I'm pleased with the steady progress with my team. Good to hear. Thank you. And next we go to the line of Kurt Halid with RBC. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Morning, Kirk. Kirk. I, uh, I echo everyone's comments on Simon, and Simon, I look forward to frequenting your restaurants. Thank you very much, Kirk. And you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Olivier, thank you so much for all the great color uh, this morning uh, with respect to the outlook on the macro and, and the specifics. And I think the one, the one area that I was looking for a little bit more color on myself uh, related to uh, the margin dynamics in, in North America and the magnitude of the potential margin improvement on a year-on-year -year basis. And I kind of ask this in the context of, as you know, uh, you don't report margins on a geographic basis you report them on a segment basis, so really just trying to get some sense on uh, on how to think about the North American margin improvement on a year-on-year -year basis. Yeah, I think I can reiterate some of the comments I made. I think the the, the level of margin improvement will be two level. Uh, I'm not talking about pricing. That is headwind that I think we have estimated to be 2 or 3%, particularly focused on, on the on the, uh, on the uh, pressure pumping, excluding um, negative uh, 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 expansion there. We, we believe that the two levers will be uh, the high grading of our portfolio to uh, capacity, capacity cap and or to exit, and the, uh, the change of uh, business model to technology access. So the impact of those two uh, set of action will uh, we believe, uh, generate and expand our margin by more than 100 BPS in North America on the way to uh, our double-digit uh, returns that uh, we have set in our strategy, uh, the pace of which I think could be accelerated if, uh, if the market conditions are favorable, could be a little bit seeing headwinds if the pricing uh, gets uh, get to deteriorate. But uh, we are confident that we will have... Uh, uh, triple-digit uh, basis points improvement in, uh, in North America at large. That, that's really helpful. Thanks for that. And then uh, just to follow up on the, on the SPM monetizations, uh, can you give us some color on how things might be progressing and, and, and how you might see uh, the opportunity to, to monetize some of those assets in 2020? Yeah, as we mentioned in the last earning call, I think uh, the process, of asset divestiture for the Bando Yasu in Argentina actually is progressing very well. So we are in the advanced stage of the divestiture there and with a closing anticipated during the first quarter of 2020 after all standard closing conditions are met. That's the situation and the progress we have. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next we go to Byron Pope with Tudor Pickering Holt. Please go ahead. Good morning. Just, oh. just, have, just have one question on capital allocation. <clears throat> now that you're evaluating all of your investments through a return on capital versus growth lands, I would, and thinking about the 2020 guidance as the CapEx is flattish year over year, I would think that North America would be down directionally. So it sort of implies that you've got some attractive opportunities to allocate capital internationally and offshore in 2020. So I was not asking for specific color, but just – uh, wondering if you could maybe give a little bit more of a, of a sense for uh, the investment opportunities that you guys have, both internationally, onshore, as well as globally offshore in 2020. Yeah, indeed. I think we'll comment on that. Why don't you comment on this, uh, Stefan? Sure, sure. Uh, good morning, Byron. 
So, as you said, our 2020 CapEx, when, when you exclude multi-client and our uh, APS investment, will be more or less in line with what we spent in, uh, in 19, so it's, uh, it's 1.7 billion. What will be different, however, is how we will uh, allocate this across our, uh, our different businesses as we apply our new uh, capital stewardship process. So to, to illustrate this, the capex that will go to our international businesses will increase in 2020 to 85% of the total spend. As a reference, uh, this percentage was, was just above 55% two years ago, so it's a significant switch. And also, we will redirect a large portion of that uh, international capex to business units that are accretive to our overall margins, and we'll have a specific focus on uh, new technology that generate premium pricing. Very helpful. Thank you. I'll turn it back. Next, we go to Mark Bianchi <clears throat> with Cohen. Please go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, following up on the, the CapEx question um, and as it relates to APS, uh, what should we be anticipating for CapEx in 2020 for APS, and, and could you talk about how that um, would be with or without the Argentina divestiture? So I think I'll, I'll take that question as, uh, as well, Stefan, here. Uh, but just before we discuss 2020, I just want to quickly take us back to, to 19. Our total uh, investment for APS was uh, 780 million, and this was already down 200 million compared to, uh, to 2018. We said in the past that we'll be managing our APS portfolio on a cash flow positive, ba positive basis, and, and cash flow is really the focus. We modulate the level of investment accordingly. And I can confirm that with this uh, 780 million capex in 19, we did generate quite a bit of, uh, of positive free cash flow, uh, actually even a, a bit above our initial expectations. So now when you get into 2020, we have uh, finalized our plans for each of our APS projects, and uh, I can say that the free cash flow from APS will increase uh, beyond 2019 significantly, actually. So the corresponding level of investment will, will clearly be lower than in 19, particularly on the back of the uh, Argentina divestiture, but we will maintain the, the level of, invet, of investment that necessary to, to generate that positive cash flow. I, I, I want to add a little bit more on the cash. I know the question is around the APS investments, but I wanted to highlight the strengths that we have seen in 19, that it will continue in 2020 on cash generation. As I said in my prepared remark, the total free cash flow reached $2.7 billion. And when you look at our commitment on the return of capital, be it dividend or the, uh, the buyback that will continue, it's more or less met by our generation of a free cash flow. In, in addition to this, when you look at the investment, uh, the divestment that we made, the proceeds that came from the two transactions, we were able to reduce the debt and we ended up with $13.1 billion. So going forward, this is, will continue to be a focus and um, I'm I took over to, to mention this fact because there was a lot of questions in the past on our uh, meeting the dividend cash flow uh, requirement. And uh, as you see in 19, we were able to mitigate the situation and to get to a point where we are within just a <clears throat> tenth of a million of dollars. Right. Thank you for that, Simon. Um, my follow-up is unrelated on, on Lyft. Um, Olivia, you mentioned uh, potentially some changes with your rod lift strategy in North America. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about the outlook there. Is it something that's just specific to the rod lift business and the capital intensity, or are you seeing some sort of a structural shift in demand? No, I think this is very specific to the capital intensive uh, Rod, uh, rod lift uh, specific uh, specific business, where we believe um, our, our strengths uh, as an organization, our technology focus as an organization is not necessarily uh, uh, best aligned with uh, uh, the support of, of this uh, of this business, and we believe that there are partners uh, that could uh, and will certainly, uh, with a focused approach, be better placed to execute uh, this uh, rod lift business in North America. So that's very similar to, uh, to what we considered in the past for drilling 
tools uh, where we reach uh, a decision to divest. Here we are evaluating that decision. Thank you. Next we go to Bill Herbert with Simmons. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Simon, can you talk about your free cash flow margin? Uh, do we attain the double-digit margin uh, in 2020? Uh, and then secondly, can you also co comment on expected working capital performance for the first half of this year? Uh, last year, uh, that was a challenge. You consumed a lot of cash in Q1 and then Q2 as well. I'm just curious as to what your expectations are for working capital in the first half of of this year. Sure, Bill. I'm going to cover a bit about 19 and give you an indication uh, going forward, but the Stefan will also free to comment on 2020 onward. As far as um, our profile is concerned, and you know this, the first half of the year we consume a bit of liquidity uh, in the uh, working capital. First oh. quarter normally there is a consumption because of compensation related um, payments on uh, year-end bonuses that comes during the first quarter. And um, as you saw in 19, mm -hmm. during the second half, we, uh, we improved this uh, working capital and we produce um, the, the free cash flow required. 2020 will be similar profile. In the first quarter, we're going to consume um, cash in the working capital, but as we have declared we are improving our um, our free cash flow generation and uh, the the in our expectation in 2020 will be to 2019 or even better so uh, this is where we are uh, the the road towards a double digit is um, well defined and i think implementation of the strategy will uh, get us over there Okay, and then and 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 then with, with regard to the actual free cash flow margin expectation for 2020, it doesn't sound like you're going to hit double digits for the year, uh, but you think that the margin will be improved because I think you were you were already at eight percent for 2019, if the math is right. You, you, your math is correct. Uh, I mean, the double digit is a, is a is an objective, and probably 2020 we will not be reaching there. Okay, thanks. Next, we go to a line of Connor Linna with Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Cameron and 1SubC in particular. Obviously, uh, some very good orders in the quarter here, um, but there was a, a, a comment around uh, some of the project margins coming in a little lower. Is that is that a one-time di dynamic in the fourth quarter, or is that sort of symptomatic of, of what margins look like on a go-forward basis? Just wondering if you could address that. Uh, good morning, Connor. Let, let me comment on this. So uh, I think we have uh, the one subsidy indeed, I think, uh, has been very successful in, in the fourth quarter to uh, raise their booking with success, particularly on the back of this Oman Lang, uh, large, uh, large integrated project for subsidy, uh, subsidy processing. And I think they are still the leader there and will keep this leadership going forward. So I'm very, uh, very confident uh, and very very happy and very pleased with the performance on, on one sub uh, Now, looking at the margin of Cameron, I think it's due to uh, two factors. Uh, indeed, the long cycle margin have been uh, for a while, and I think we have been very clear on this, under uh, margin compression. The backlog that uh, uh, both one sub and drilling to a lesser extent have booked in the last uh, couple of years have been at, at, uh, at reduced uh, margin due to the, the market condition and pricing uh, condition that have deteriorated. This has been offset partially or fully in the last two years by uh, short cycle uh, business that did benefit from the, the growth in, in Nile until, until uh, last year and uh, did offset and uh, kept the margin very healthy. Now the combination of uh, low North America activity pricing headwinds for the long cycle, the short cycle combined with this backlog have created a condition of uh, the margin we have seen. This is not here to stay. Uh, it will take a couple of quarters to recover, but I do expect uh, the margin of, uh, of uh, Cameron over time, and certainly in 2020, to recover and uh, to uh, grow compared to 19 and, and go back to 18. That makes sense. Uh, it just in terms of 
the North America realignment. Is there a significant impact we should think about uh, on cost savings or, or scaling down in Cameron, or is that largely related to traditional oil field services? It's largely related to traditional uh, oil field services. I think, as I commented before, uh, the common performance have been uh, have been strong uh, until until recent time. I think last quarter was a bit of a, a challenge due to the severe uh, trough. Now, uh, for some of our short cycle, we will still continue to adjust and make sure that uh, we are structured to uh, to uh, uh, be aligned with the market condition, both pricing and uh, with the size of the market. And we will continue to expand our carbon uh, franchise internationally as we have been successful. So uh, I would expect that the, uh, the, the short cycle will, uh, will be adjusted uh, structurally to, uh, to reflect the market condition. And we will uh, divert, divert and, and increase our focus on international as we have done the last couple of years. Got it. Thanks for the color. And our last question will come from the line of Chase Mulvihill with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Please go ahead. Hello? It's open. Go ahead. Morning, Chase. Hello? Yeah, good Here morning. We can hear you. Hey, hey, sorry. Uh, um, so I want to come back to uh, the uh, the pressure pumping and the amount of capacity that, that you've actually reduced. So, you know, if, if I do the math correctly, it sounds like that you've stacked about 600,000 horsepower in 2019, and, and maybe you entered the year 2019 with about 700,000 horsepower cold stacked. If I've done my math right. Um, so how should we think about how much of that could come back and, and the cost um, that it would that it would take to bring that capacity back into the market? Chase, our, our intention here is not to cold stack or one stop and, and bring it back. Our intention here is, uh, is to right size the capacity which we did, restructure the, the organization which we are doing, and uh, refocus on where we believe we have the best alignment with uh, our customers, we have the best leverage for technology, reservoir technology or surface efficiency technology differentiation, and we can bring the most benefit to, the, to our customer and to the market. We have done this, and we don't intend to, uh, to bring back capacity uh, going forward. Okay, all right, that makes sense. That clears some things up. I've been getting a lot of questions about that. Um, coming over to the international side, um, you know, you guys are focused on margins. It seems like a lot of your peers are focused on margin improvement on the international side. Um, so maybe could you talk about pricing on international? Um, you know, it, it, given that you know, everybody's focused on margins, are you seeing more discipline on pricing? Um, are you able to, to push pricing in, in particular in the Middle East uh, at this point yet? Similar to command we made last quarter, I think there is still a dynamic where on large integrated contracts and high volume contracts, uh, we still see bit in Middle East or elsewhere internationally. We still see um, negative pricing pressure or downward pricing pressure. Well, by contrast, uh, in more remote uh, uh, location, on more specific uh, exploration, offshore, or uh, difficult project execution, we see and we have seen and we have had the opportunity to uh, negotiate better price and we see better also discipline from uh, in the market on both uh, on all the, the service providers. So I would say the market is still contrasted with uh, large integrated contract and uh, discrete uh, offshore exploration or remote location and we believe this uh, trend will continue in 2020. Okay, uh, appreciate the color. I'll turn it back over. Thanks. So I believe that uh, concerning the time, I think we'll have to uh, conclude this call. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to highlight my key message to conclude uh, to close this call. First, the solid result of the fourth quarter and the full year have highlighted the significant progress we have made in our international franchise and the early steps we took in the execution of our North America land strategy. The momentum across our organization and the feedback from our customers continue to be very positive and support well our ambition for 2020. Our view for 2020 remains positive on the international market, which will be loaded on the back end of the year, particularly in deep water activity. Internationally, we will benefit from further improvement in activity mix and revenue quality, 
which, when combined with our capital stewardship and performance program, will drive further margin expansion as a continuity of progress made in the second half of 2019. In contrast, we face another year of declining North American market condition, but will accelerate our NAL strategy to fast-track our commitment to restore double-digit margins. Our actions, including scale-to-fit capacity reduction, rationalization towards asset light through technology access, and anticipated business unit exit, will combine to reverse margin decline and with the ambition to grow both earnings and cash flow in contrast to 2019. While 2019 opened a new chapter for the company, 2020 offers the opportunity to amplify the impact of our new performance vision for the benefit of our customers and to accelerate key strategy elements to improve returns for the benefit of our shareholders. Thank you very much for your participation today. Good day to everyone. I look forward to seeing many of you in the coming weeks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.